Welcome to the Versus History Podcast with your hosts, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, Connell Smith and Elliot Watson. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of Versus History, the podcast. It's me, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, at History Chappie. On behalf of the editors, today we are joined by Dr. John F. Lyons, who, like me, was born in London, England, in the United Kingdom. And he now lives in Chicago in the US of A. He earned his PhD in history from the University of Illinois at Chicago and works as a professor of history at the Juliet Junior College in Illinois, where he teaches US history and British history, too. He has published five books, and his most recent publication is Joy and Fear, The Beatles, Chicago and the 1960s published in 2021. John, I hope that brief introduction has done you some justice. We are delighted to have you with us here at Versus History. Thanks for being here, sir. Well, hello, Patrick, and uh, hello, uh, listeners. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, that's as good an introduction as I've ever had. Thank you very much indeed. All good so far. Okay, tell us a little bit about you then, John. Tell us, I mean, I've give, I painted something of a picture, but just to tell us a little bit about you, about Chicago and about the Beatles, just to set the scene. Over to you. Yeah, I was born in uh, London uh, in the uh, 60s. And so I remember the Beatles as I was growing up. You know, I, I kind of, uh, I was, they were always there in my life, really. But um, I uh, left school when I was about 16 and uh, I worked in uh, construction for about 12 years. And then I went to uh, night school for a couple of years in London and that allowed me to go to college. So I actually went to college uh, quite late in uh, life. And uh, I went to uh, Salford University and then uh, I went to Warwick University and I did a student exchange in uh, America. I went to Detroit for a year and I met my uh, wife there in one of the history classes. How romantic. We met over Very in much history. so. Yeah. And uh, then we moved to uh, Chicago, and I've lived in Chicago ever since. And like you said, I, I work in a, a community college in uh, just outside uh, Chicago, and I live in, in the city. Uh, in terms of where is Chicago, Chicago is... Uh, it, they often call it the flyover city because it's right in the middle of the, uh, the U.S., and uh, you've got on the one side, New York, and on the other side, California. Yeah, and uh, Chicago is, uh, it's a big city. It, uh, in the 60s, it was the second largest city in the US. I think it's now fallen to about uh, third or fourth. And uh, it's right in the middle of the US. So it's kind of uh, often referred to as the flyover city because uh, people visit the East Coast where New York is or the West Coast where LA is, but often they miss uh, Chicago. And Chicago is a relatively new city, certainly compared to uh, Europe. And uh, it really took its uh, major features after the uh, Great Fire of uh, Chicago in 1871. Uh, it's the first city to uh, produce skyscrapers. So if you come to Chicago, you'll see a lot of tall, gleaming uh, skyscrapers. It's a very uh, modern looking city, but it's also right on the banks of uh, Lake Michigan. So we do actually have a beach here. And uh, a lot of people go to the beaches in the, uh, the summer. In terms of the Beatles, they uh, come from Liverpool in England, the north of England. And uh, they uh, made their first record. Their first record was released in October 1962. And they worked together very long. They actually split up in 1970. So really, uh, they only produced records for about eight years. And in terms of their sales, they are pretty much the uh, biggest selling band in the world. And they're, they're, they're not only uh, known uh, because of their music, but also because they were a big cultural and social influence on uh, not only Britain, but I think uh, the Western world at least, and maybe even further beyond. Thanks for that, John. A great way to start. Okay, your book then focuses on the reception to the Beatles in just one city, that city being Chicago, not America generally. Why did you choose to focus on just this one city? Yeah, I, want, I set out to, uh, the book was going to be about uh, the American impact or the impact of the Beatles on America and the way that the Americans viewed uh, the Beatles. And pretty quickly I realised, and uh, if you look at America in the 1960s, it was a very diverse 
regionalized uh, country. And uh, each major city in each region of the country had their own uh, ethnic and racial demographics, their own traditions and histories, uh, their own political uh, structures. Over here, we have a state system, but also cities have their own uh, aldermen and mayors, etc. Also, uh, each region has their own TV stations, their own newspapers, uh, their own radio stations and uh, their own music scenes. One band could be very popular in one part of the country and unheard of in another. So it didn't make much sense for me to start talking about uh, the, uh, the American attitude to the Beatles, because there was just so many different attitudes with all this regional differences. So therefore, I realized pretty quickly I would have to talk about one particular place. And I picked Chicago because uh, it was in the 60s, the second largest city in uh, the US. It uh, has a large African American student and suburban population, and I wanted to study all of these. I also think it's a city that people would be interested in. It uh, was a city that uh, encompassed many of the sort of major events of the 60s, really. It was uh, a place where it was a famous uh, riot in the uh, Democratic National Convention in 1968. Uh, there was also urban riots here in 64 and 66. It was the place where Chicago blues came from and early rock and roll uh, came from here, especially through Chess uh, Records, which is where Chuck Berry and people like Bo Diddley uh, recorded. It was the place where Martin Luther King came to in the 60s to spread his civil rights movement. And uh, so it was a place also where there was a large uh, student uh, population. And uh, one of the groups that uh, was uh, uh, based here was uh, Students for a Democratic Society, which was one of the major student organizations in the 60s. So it has a lot of sort of very interesting events that took place in the 60s, took, took place in Chicago. And the Beatles kind of were weaved in to some of those events. So I thought that would interest the, uh, the, the general audience as well. And then also, uh, when I do uh, 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 what we call in history, it's, it's a community study where you just look in at one particular area, in this case, uh, Chicago. But uh, what I do is I compare it to what was happening elsewhere. So once you look at a place and you see what's kind of uh, similar and different between Chicago and the rest of the US or Chicago and uh, Europe, I think it really brings to light then about uh, a particular place and a particular people and about how the Beatles influenced particular radio stations in Chicago, particular music scene, how particular politicians uh, responded to them, how uh, music scenes responded to them. And so therefore, I think doing a uh, local study like this, one on Chicago, I think it does uh, give us much more detail and avoids those sort of generalizations that you would uh, have if you did uh, a book on about American attitude to the uh, to the Beatles. Okay, then next question for you. The Beatles were huge in the UK in 1963, but still to a large extent unknown in the United States of America. How and why did the Beatles eventually succeed in the US of A? Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's kind of strange today. I think people would uh, find it very, very strange that there was basically a phenomena taking place in England in 1963. The Beatles were, they were a national phenomena, there's no doubt about that. They'd already had a number of number one singles. Their albums were at number one and dominated the charts. They'd appeared on every single major TV show. They'd appeared at the London Palladium, which was the major sort of entertainment venue in uh, uh, Britain. They appeared even in front of the royal family. And so, uh, you know, they, they were literally a, a national treasure in uh, Britain by the end of the 1960s. Every newspaper covered them on the front page of newspapers and magazines, et cetera, et cetera. And yet unknown in the US. You know, how could this be possible? You kind of say to yourself. And it's basically because there was no social media like there is today. You know, if something happens in uh, Britain today, it becomes a social phenomena. We know about it in America, but that wasn't the case in, uh, in 1963. And so what the, uh, the, the uh, uh, record label 
that uh, produced the Beatles records was uh, EMI. And they had a subsidiary in America, which was called Capital. And so when the Beatles records uh, started to come out, like I say, the first one was October 1962, they sent them to Capital Records in America to get them released in America. And Capital uh, Records refused. And the reason they refused is because no other English act had had any kind of success in the US. There might have been individual hit singles, but there was no sustained career by a British artist in uh, America. And so uh, therefore they just thought, oh, this was just another English group that isn't gonna make it. And they refused to release their records. So eventually what EMI had to do is they had to give it to uh, just a local record label to release them. One that had very little money for promotion. And uh, by happenstance, that record label was based in Chicago. Chicago's uh, uh, record label was called VJ. And they were the first record label to release a, a Beatles single, which at the time was Please Please Me. And uh, the first one to, uh, to release a Beatles album uh, in America. So Chicago plays a major role in the uh, early Beatles. But uh, like I say, they never got uh, much airplay then. It, it charted in uh, Chicago, but not really elsewhere, the first single. And so therefore, throughout 1963, while the Beatles were becoming a phenomena in uh, England, they were pretty much ignored in the, uh, the US. Like I say, their records got nowhere because they were on small record labels. By the end of 63, by about November, they got so much publicity in uh, the UK because they appeared in front of the Royal Family and they appeared at the London Palladium, that they started to get some coverage in the US media, in newspapers and little snippets on uh, TV. But they, they didn't talk or they didn't focus on the Beatles music. What they focused on was the reaction of the crowds. Because the, uh, the Beatles crowds are predominantly made up of uh, teenage girls. And they were going crazy. They were screaming and uh, they seemed to be sort of out of control, even though I don't think they were. But they kind of looked that to uh, a lot of uh, the media. They started to get publicity because of that. So therefore, you see in the newspapers in about November, December 63, that uh, the Beatles started to get some coverage in newspapers. But it wasn't about their music. It was about these crazy British girls. This is not British. The British are people who have a stiff upper lip. We are people that are very staid and stern. And here was these thousands of screaming girls going nuts. And that's what got them the coverage in uh, America in November, December. And eventually that's what forced Capitol Records to release uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand, uh, which came out in December 63. And that became their first major hit, first number one record in America in January 1964. OK, then who were the Beatlephobes that you describe in great detail in your book? Yeah, I call the book uh, Joy and Fear because uh, I think the Beatles were able to embody uh, joy. You know, that was really what was uh, made them uh, so special. But because of their music, because of the uh, their look, because of their personalities, they really sort of embodied joy. They were able to package it and sell it to a larger audience. But uh, I also call the book uh, Fear. It's called Joy and Fear. That's because for a lot of people, they were a joyous experience and they loved the Beatles. But a lot of people feared them. And uh, in terms of who were the people I call Beatle phobes, the first ones were boys. Boys generally did not like the Beatles. And one of the reasons was is because girls liked them. So when teenage girls liked the Beatles, they were seen, therefore, as a girly thing. And boys did not want, young boys, anything that was girly. They didn't want to be sissies, which was a word that was used in the 60s. So therefore, the, 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 the initial phobes were the uh, boys who didn't like uh, the Beatles. But also in America, there was uh, people that I called cultural traditionalists. And these were people that were really... Uh, uh, ones that uh, they accepted or believed in conventional gender roles. They believed that uh, people should have respect for authority. They also believed that uh, people should have self-restraint. And when they looked at the Beatles, they, uh, they were worried because what they saw in the Beatles was the long hair, 
which suggested hedonism. It suggested also a mixing of the genders. For some people, it suggested that uh, they were gay. For others, that they were just effeminate. Uh, they were also worried that uh, their teenage audiences seemed to be going out of control. And uh, this was something also that uh, worried these cultural traditionalists. And also there was, at that time in America, the civil rights movement was uh, in, in full effect. And uh, there was already beginnings of a sort of a women's movement. And I, th I think a lot of these cultural traditionalists saw the Beatles as sort of adding to this uh, a growth of uh, uh, opposition to conventional traditional American values. Uh, the other people that didn't like the Beatles, and you could call them traditionalists as well as the church, most, most different denominations of different churches were worried about uh, the Beatles because for one reason, they always said that they were agnostics, which uh, in the 1960s was pretty unusual for people not to claim, especially coming from uh, Britain, claiming to be uh, Christian. And the other reason is because uh, they thought that the, uh, these, the churches thought that they were sending the teenage audiences towards or away from spiritual matters and towards more sensual matters. And so I think the church was worried about the Beatles for these two reasons, the effect they had on their audience and also a lot of the things they said about uh, their uh, religious views. And then finally, uh, again, you know, most of your uh, listeners would know, but there was something uh, that happened here in uh, 1776, which was called the American Revolution. And that was basically where there was uh, the, the, the uh, people here rose up, or a lot of people rose up against the British, and uh, the British uh, lost the American Revolution, and they were expelled from America. And I think after that, there was a strong current of anti-British feeling, quite understandably. And it was helped then in 1812, uh, uh, when there was the War of 1812 between uh, Britain and uh, America as well, when the Brits decided to uh, burn down uh, the White House, Washington, D.C., the capital of America. And uh, that was sustained, I think, over the next 100, 150 years, this anti-British feeling. And even when the Beatles came, there was a lot of people that were still worried about uh, British influence and saw that the British were uh, something that should be pretty much avoided. And so therefore there was an anti-British feeling towards uh, the Beatles or anybody that came here. And uh, so I think that sort of played into it as well. So in other words, the Beatle phobes are a combination of uh, people that are worried about their religious ideas, worried about their more liberal views, uh, that their fan base was overwhelmingly female. And uh, I do think that their, their Britishness did also uh, hinder some people's ability to uh, accept uh, the Beatles. All right. The Beatles' first visit to Chicago, Illinois, was back in September 1964 on their very first US tour. Could you tell us about their arrival and what you found out about the concert itself. The, uh, the Beatles first came to uh, the US in February 64, but that was just uh, really to appear on a, a live TV show, which is called The Ed Sullivan Show, and also to uh, perform in a couple of concerts, but it was not a major tour. But they returned in the summer of 64 for their first major uh, tour of North America. And this was such an unusual tour. They'd never seen anything like it really before in uh, America, this sort of tour. I'll give you an idea. They played 32 shows in 24 cities in 33 days. And they flew from city to city in uh, a plane. So they, 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 they flew everywhere. And... Uh, they uh, also didn't organize the tour very well. So it wasn't as if they started in the West Coast and gradually moved east. They were going back and forth, north and south, east and west across America. So it was an enormously tiring and just uh, overwhelming experience to be doing that many shows in that amount of time. And also uh, the local authorities were not used to uh, these big crowds. They were not used to the reaction that the Beatles took. The police didn't know what to do. The airports didn't know what to do. And uh, they started in America on that tour in uh, August, middle of August. And they finally came to uh, Chicago on September the 5th, 
So by the time they got to Chicago on September the 5th, the authorities in Chicago were extremely worried about uh, the Beatles. And the uh, the mayor of Chicago at the time, was, uh, his name was Richard J. Daly. And he was what you'd call a cultural traditionalist, somebody who uh, certainly never had any time for uh, the Beatles. But he was also somebody who uh, was very concerned about law and order. And there'd already been sort of civil rights activities in Chicago. There was actually uh, school strikes where students went on strike over uh, uh, inequalities in the school system. And also, as the mayor was reading about the reaction to the Beatles in all these other cities before they came to Chicago, he was getting more and more worried. And so therefore, when the, uh, Chicago, when the Beatles came to Chicago, they, they played in uh, Milwaukee, which was very close to Chicago the day before. And so it was only a 20 minute flight. But what the uh, Mayor Daly wanted to do is he wanted to keep the uh, location of their landing a secret because he didn't want crowds to gather at the airport. And so therefore, when they came to Chicago on September the 5th, it was supposed to be a secret. But the only problem was, is that the promoter uh, press secretary gave uh, or released to the media the uh, place and the time of where they were going to land. And the place they were going to land was at the major airport, which was O'Hare. And so Mayor Daly quickly changed it, that the Beatles actually arrived in another airport in the south of the city called Midway. And uh, that was supposed to be kept a secret. And also uh, when they arrived, they didn't arrive at the main terminal. They arrived at an airfield right out in the middle of the airport. So he did all he could to basically make sure that uh, nobody was at the airport when they arrived. He also made sure they never stayed in the city. Uh, the hotels wouldn't take them on. They weren't allowed to stay at any of the major hotels or any hotels. So therefore, they had to come in Chicago and leave the same day. And they actually came into Chicago at 4.30. And believe it or not, they're already after a uh, press conference and a concert. They already left Chicago by 11.30 at night. They were barely in the city for uh, seven hours. Now, the person that uh, was the promoter of the concerts, his name was Frank Freed. And again, he had no experience, really, of uh, putting on a major pop concert. He'd put on a lot of folk shows and other entertainment, but not a major sort of pop concert that would uh, attract enormous crowds. So he, um, he booked a place called the International Amphitheatre to show the, uh, the Beatles. And that was a, a place that held 13,000 uh, people. And when they put the tickets on sale, they had applicants for 50 thousand tickets so frank freed realized almost immediately that the uh, demand for tickets was much higher than he ever thought it would be and so he tried to get the beatles to play another show but they were so busy already that they couldn't so they actually played at a thirteen thousand venue where they could quite easily have played at a uh, venue holding uh, 50, 000, uh people and then, like I say, it was uh, the, the, the other thing about the Beatles, again, a lot of your listening audience probably goes to concerts today. There was no light show, you know, like you hit the sea today. It's just basically a floodlight on the, uh, the stage. There was no sophisticated sound equipment. There was no monitors where they could hear themselves uh, play. So the sound was enormously uh, bad. And also uh, most of the audience was screaming. And so you couldn't hear much. The lighting show was not of uh, any great uh, validity. And uh, also, uh, they only played for 30 minutes. 30 minutes. You can't imagine going to a concert today where the group only plays for 30 minutes. I was going to say, the uh, warm-up act could probably play for longer than that. Exactly. 30 minutes. I mean, I actually went to see, uh, I don't know if you know this person, but uh, his name is Role Model. He's quite a new sort of singer. And I saw him in Chicago recently, and he played for one hour. And we all left there thinking about how short that was. We couldn't believe that he only played for one hour. You think the Beatles played for half of that? 30 minutes. That's all they played in every city. Sometimes even quicker. They used to play as fast as they could so that they could get out of there even quicker. So they used to play for 25 minutes. But, but anyway, so in terms of the, uh, the, the concert in 64, it was uh, just something that they'd uh, never seen before. And then just the final point to say is that Frank Freed, the promoter, like I say, he didn't know anything about putting on a pop show. A lot of the, the concerts at that time were starting to be put on by or promoted by radio, local radio stations where they had their DJs on the stage to... MC the show and produce to uh, introduce the bands that came on 
in Chicago, they actually, uh, Frank Freed got his friend, a local middle-aged male newspaper reporter to act as MC for the show. And a few days before the show, he ran a column in the news, local newspaper where he was basically talking about how horrible the Beatles were. So it gives you some sort of idea that just you know, 1964 was just absolutely crazy uh, tour. And the, uh, the stop in Chicago was just something that uh, Mayor Daly, the promoters, nobody really had any kind of uh, idea about what to expect. You devote a whole chapter in the book to the Beatles' influence on the Chicago music scene. Many of our listeners, I'm sure, will be perhaps more familiar, perhaps not, with more recent Chicago musical innovations such as the warehouse raves, perhaps EDM, links to rap music, house music. So what was the mid-1960s Chicago music scene like? 20 odd years before house and acid house and the Chicago rave warehouse scene blew up. So what was the mid 60s Chicago music scene like? Over to you. Yeah, Chicago has got a history of amazing uh, music. And much of it, most of it really is African-American. If you think about it, the, uh, you know, jazz music started in the South, but certainly it, it came into its own when, when uh, a lot of African-Americans moved to Chicago in the 1920s and uh, became the, the sort of center of um, uh, jazz music. And also gospel music came from here. Uh, and then in the 1950s, uh, they uh, started to produce what became known as Chicago blues, which was electric blues. And out of that then came rock and roll. And I mentioned about Chess Records was based in Chicago, people like Chuck Berry and uh, Bo Diddley. And uh, in terms of uh, rock music, uh, uh, you know, if you want to say white rock music, uh, in the 1960s, there was uh, a scene that uh, was not that very well known outside of uh, Chicago. But in terms of the origins of that scene, I think the origins of that scene is certainly uh, starts with the Beatles and also other British acts that became popular in the early 60s, such as the Rolling Stones were very popular in the Kinks in uh, America. But anyway, the origins of it is this. The, the Beatles came to um, America, like I said, in February 1964, and they appeared on the uh, Ed Sullivan show live. And uh, this was the first time people actually saw them. Before that, they may have uh, seen snippets of them, or uh, they certainly heard their records. But uh, again, hard to believe today, but uh, they, would, they never had obviously any other media to view uh, the Beatles. So this is the first time most Americans saw them on the Ed Sullivan show in February 64. And it garnered a record audience. More people saw the Beatles on that show on February the 9th, 1964 than they had on any previous, uh, 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 more people saw that show than they did any previous uh, program in American history up to that point. So it gives you an idea of uh, how people are already eager to see the Beatles that they'd already uh, heard. But when a lot of people saw them on the show, a lot of uh, young people, uh, they thought not only did it look real fun, what they were doing, but it looked very easy. The Beatles make it look very easy. And if you look at them, uh, you know, you can see that they're all sort of laughing. They're all smiling at each other. Uh, Ringo Starr, who's the drummer, was very sort of high up at the back of the stage on a, on a riser, which is very unusual for a, um, a uh, drummer. And also there was no uh, prominent uh, solo singer at the front. You know, there was all sort of, you could look at all four people rather than just a solo singer with a backing group, which was what was prevalent at the time. And so therefore uh, a lot of people sitting at home, young people saw this and they thought, wow, this is such fun. You know, it's just like a small gang of people and uh, it seemed so easy. So the following day, people ran out to buy guitars and drums. And they started to form bands all over America, but in Chicago as well. And a lot of these bands then started to uh, play in basements and uh, at house parties. But what they realized uh, quite uh, quickly was that the Beatles made it look easy, but it was not easy to replicate their sound. Their, their chord structures were actually very complicated. 
Uh, they were all very good musicians. It was not easy to play the music. They had the harmonies that were very difficult to replicate. So a lot of these uh, kids that started to uh, form bands, they realized that they really couldn't sound that much like uh, the Beatles. They just couldn't be as good as them. But what was coming into America at that time was uh, people like the Rolling Stones and the Kinks. And they started to produce music that uh, was a little bit easier to play. And uh, so therefore, a lot of these youngsters, even though they were influenced by the Beatles to form groups, a lot of the music that they actually played was very much influenced by uh, the, uh, the Kinks and uh, the Rolling Stones and probably the Yardbirds was another uh, major influence. But anyway, in terms of who were these groups, the first one to have a hit was uh, the Shadows of Night, who were very much like the Rolling Stones. Then there was a, the, the first Chicago group to have a number one hit was called the Buckinghams. And there was other ones like the Crying Shames and uh, the New Colony Six. But the only ones that actually had hits in uh, England was uh, the American Breed and the, uh, the Ides of March. And the reason for that was because, again, most of the, the, the record labels were on the East and West Coast. So there was a lot of groups uh, in Chicago, but they didn't really sort of uh, become that uh, greatly popular uh, outside uh, the US or even many of them outside Chicago. And that's because the uh, the record labels and record business was mostly in uh, New York or in uh, LA. And it, there wasn't much of a record business as such major labels in Chicago. So therefore, and also the media, was based on the East and West Coast. And therefore, Chicago groups never got the same sort of coverage as uh, other groups in New York or LA. And that's, I think, why they never became as uh, popular. But the, they certainly did produce some great music. And many of it was on small record labels that uh, today uh, the records are worth a fortune because there wasn't many of them uh, sold. But the other thing about the, uh, the music scene in the 60s is uh, before then, before the Beatles, most of the people that played music were boys and most of the people that consumed music were girls. There was a big gender difference between people who played the music and people who bought the records. But uh, that changed as well because of the Beatles. And I think it changed because uh, it wasn't just boys that looked at the Beatles and thought we could do that. It was also girls. And the reason why girls looked at Beatles and thought we could do that is because if you look at the Beatles, they do kind of look a little bit effeminate. You know, they have the long hair. They used to wear these uh, Chelsea boots with these high uh, heels. And uh, to put it bluntly, they're all pretty scrawny, sort of boyish looking. And so therefore, I think girls could kind of see themselves up on the, uh, the stage. They didn't look that macho. They looked much more effeminate. And also the Beatles music uh, included a lot of harmonies that they actually uh, were very much influenced by uh, uh, girl singers. There was a lot of uh, female uh, groups of girl singers in the 60s, not musicians, but girl singers. And the Beatles sort of uh, used a lot of the harmonies that they used. And uh, also the Beatles lyrics were very much directed at girls as well. So I think a lot of uh, girls for the first time could see uh, in the Beatles that they could do that. They could see themselves in uh, doing what the Beatles were doing. So therefore, a lot of all-female musician groups were formed in uh, the 60s, and many of them in Chicago. And uh, I'll just give you a, a mention of uh, a couple of them that you might be interested in finding. As one of them is called the Daughters of Eve. And uh, funnily enough, I've got a, a teenage daughter, and I mentioned the, the Daughters of Eve, Eve to her, and she said... Oh, I know them. I was actually playing one of their records. And she said, yeah, I know them. I heard that on TikTok. Patrick, I don't know if you even know what TikTok is. But, I've, uh, heard she, I've heard of it. She found uh, their music on TikTok. And so they became quite popular uh, now, which they were never that popular in the 60s uh, because of the factors that I uh, mentioned. But uh, So there was a lot of females that also uh, uh, were influenced by the Beatles to form groups as well. And... Uh, the Chicago music scene, then once they started to form groups, they wanted places to play. And so a lot of teen clubs opened up in the city. And teen clubs were places where, as they said, uh, they used to uh, limit the uh, people who could come there to uh, age. Well, you had to be between the age of, uh, I think it was about 14 to, to 20. And they were places that wouldn't sell alcohol. So they were designed for a teenage audience. And one of the most popular ones 
that I mentioned in the book is uh, uh, was called The Cellar. And it was started by a, uh, a, a man in uh, just a sleepy suburb in Chicago called Arlington Heights. And his, his name was Paul so uh, Sampson. And he um, uh, was running a small record store in this sleepy suburb before the Beatles. And that would have been his life. But then the Beatles came along and people started to ask for Beatles records. And uh, he started to read up on the Beatles and he noticed they played in a place called The Cavern in Liverpool, a small club in Liverpool is where they uh, came from. They played there about 200 times. And he thought to himself that uh, maybe he could start something like The Cavern. And all these local groups that were uh, beginning to uh, form in the local area, they could play there. So anyway, so he found a space, uh, which was a basement uh, building. And instead of calling it The Cavern, he called it the cellar and he started to put on these local groups, but then he started to put on other groups as well that were coming from. And this was only a place that held about 700 people. It's only a small club. And believe it or not, you will know some of these, Patrick, being the age that you are. And that was uh, he put on groups there like the Birds, Buffalo Springfield, who are from America and Sly and the Family Stone, very big groups. But also the Who played there, the Yardbirds, wow. the Cream or I should say cream, not the cream. Cream, yes, played at this small club. So it was quite an enormous, uh, you know, phenomena, really, that somebody like that, uh, the only reason he got involved in the, uh, you know, the, the, the um, industry of promoting groups and putting on their groups is because of the Beatles. And so they had an influence, not only in the Chicago uh, groups, music scene, but also much more in general. And also Chicago Radio then adopted the Beatles and they used to also play these local groups as well to uh, fill up uh, airspace. So therefore, the Chicago music scene in the 60s was a real thriving uh, scene, but uh, didn't really get much uh, publicity outside the US and even uh, a lot of them not even in uh, the US. So, John, by the time the Beatles had returned to Chicago, Illinois in 1966 for their very last tour of the US, their world and the world around them had changed significantly. How different was their visit in 66 as compared to that which took place just two years before in 1964? Yeah, this is, again, the remarkable thing about the Beatles, really. And that is, I would advise all your listeners to just go and sort of like listen to just a sprinkling of Beatles music and their music changed so much from each record to record. You know, like I said, they only recorded really for about seven or eight years and uh, each album that they produced was different to the last one. And that was one of the things about the Beatles is they, they, they wanted to do something new all the time. They were experimental. And not only that, I also want you to go and look at the album covers or look at photos of the Beatles from each of those years, from 62, 63 on to 1970. And you'll see again how radically they changed in their look in the space of that number of years. And uh, that's also replicated in their personalities. That as they became uh, more popular and started to see the world a bit more, they became much more interested in things like religion and much more interested in politics and things that are happening around them. And so in 64, when they came to America, you could pretty much say they were just uh, a band that was uh, just wanted to play their music. And that was really it. But when they came in 1966, they had changed. They had become more interested in uh, the, what was the, the, the major war at the time, which was in Vietnam. There was a major conflict there and they opposed the U.S. involvement in it. They also became uh, interested in uh, things like CND, which was a campaign for nuclear uh, disarmament, getting rid of nuclear weapons. Uh, they became more interested in uh, 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 the, the world around them in general, what was happening in other countries. And also, of course, they'd grown up, again, only a short space of time, but uh, three of them already got married. Lennon, uh, Harrison and uh, Star were married. McCartney was the, the last one to get married out of the four of them. But uh, so they've become uh, more mature. And in terms of uh, America itself, America has also changed. You know, the audience now, uh, a lot of boys started to realise that the Beatles were actually good. And it wasn't just a girl thing. Or if it was a girl thing, you know, we could still like them. And so you see more boys start to appear at the show. You know, it's not only girls now. 
And also what was happening in uh, America was that uh, it was becoming more conservative. I think there was a rise of conservatism in the 1960s that often is, uh, it's kind of ignored. You know, you kind of see the 60s, maybe some of your listeners know about hippies and uh, the counterculture and people like Woodstock that. Woodstock Music Festival? Yeah, Woodstock maybe people know about. And I think people have that image of sort of like the 60s has been a very liberal decade. But at the same time, there was a rise of conservatism. And uh, between 64 and 66, I'll give you a couple of examples. In, there was a, a, a president uh, in America that became president in 1980 called Ronald Reagan, who was, uh, he's seen as sort of like the father of modern conservatism, really. Well, he actually became known in the 60s because he ran for the, uh, the governor of California in 1966, just before the Beatles come to America. Well, as the Beatles came to America in 66, he was running a successful campaign, which eventually he would become the governor of uh, California. But also if you look at the, uh, they have uh, in America uh, elections, local elections, and also elections to Congress. And again, in 66, they started, to, you start to see the Republicans uh, gain in all different areas, you know, from the, the congressional national elections to local elections down into uh, Illinois, which is a state where Chicago is. And so you also see this sort of like growing conservatism that was taking place. And so therefore, when, when the Beatles came to America in 66, there was this sort of background that they were different, but also America, I think, was uh, different. And I'll give you one example of this to illustrate this, the the this sort of rise of conservatism and how it affected the Beatles. And that was a, a story about, uh, that became known as the, the bigger than Jesus uh, issue. And in terms of what happened there is John Lennon gave an interview in, uh, to an English newspaper, London newspaper in March, 1966, where he said that uh, Christianity was declining. He was talking about religion. And he used the Beatles as, as an example. He said that young people now, are liking the Beatles more than they are liking Christianity. And uh, the, the Beatles are now more popular than Christianity. So he was making the point about in England, Christianity was uh, declining. And uh, in terms of organized religion, and that is true, you know, all statistics show that, that that was what was happening. Now, it didn't get uh, that much publicity in the UK, but in uh, July to August, just before they uh, came to America for their 66 concert tour, that interview was uh, run in another publication, an American teenage magazine called Datebook. And when it was run in America, it was taken up by DJs in the, the southern states. And they started to exaggerate the story. And they started to say that John Lennon was comparing himself and the Beatles to Jesus and saying that they were bigger than Jesus and it started off a storm of controversy where the Beatles records were being banned radio stations wouldn't play them where the uh, they were having uh, fires in different parts of America not just in the south which is the more conservative part of America but also in the north where there was a, a fires of Beatles records and memorabilia there was a campaign to stop the Beatles coming to America and so there was a big furore about the Beatles coming to America in 66. And actually, when they arrived, John Lennon had to do a press conference in front of all the major media, including the TV companies, where he had to apologize for his uh, remarks. And that tour, each stop on that tour, basically never sold out. The other tours that they did, pretty much most of the concerts sold out, but in 66, they didn't. And uh, in Chicago... The only way that the uh, uh, the concert sold out is because uh, the uh, promoter, who was the same promoter as in 64, he actually gave away a lot of tickets to uh, friends who then basically tried to sell them or get to give them away. And so it gives you some sort of indication. So therefore, in 66, America had changed and so had the Beatles. And I think this story uh, of the, the bigger than, so-called bigger than Jesus controversy really does sort of uh, exemplify the uh, the changes that take place in America, but also the fact that he would be talking about religion in uh, 66. You suggest in your final chapters, John, that the Beatles split was mainly met with indifference in Chicago. 
that might seem strange to some of our listeners who perhaps had the idea that the Beatles were huge news and the split would have been met with perhaps the same angst that that of Take That was in the 1990s. Can you talk to us a bit about this, so the split of the Beatles and why it was met in such a way? Yeah, I, I must say I was surprised at this because uh, the, in terms of when the Beatles broke up, they pretty much broke up in a, It's a bit complicated, but they broke up pretty much in April 1970. And the world became uh, aware of it when uh, a uh, front page headline appeared in the Daily Mirror in uh, April, on April the 10th, 1970, which said that Paul McCartney had quit the Beatles. And that's kind of seen as the, the moment. So it was on the front page of the Daily Mirror in England. But then I, I, I always read about, uh, you know, that this was news that was on front pages all over the world. You know, you'd expect because the Beatles were so big that it would be everywhere. So I started to look in newspapers in Chicago and I found that actually rather than being on the front page, it was tucked away in page six, page 10, page 14. And then I thought, well, it must be just Chicago. So I started looking at L.A. and New York and Boston news and it was replicated there. It just did not get nowhere near the amount of publicity that you would think that it would have got. And the obvious question is, why is that? You know, why is it that, uh, that you know, the Beatles were not as newsworthy in 1970? And I think there's a, there's a few reasons. One is that uh, the Beatles, after that 66 tour, the one I mentioned about the Bigger Than Jesus controversy, they never toured again, they stopped touring. And so they made records in recording studios, but they never toured any of the records. But at the same time, there was a huge growth in uh, live music in uh, both in Europe and in North America. And the sound that I mentioned in 64, that had become much, much better now. They were now able to reproduce the sound a lot easier. They also had these much more elaborate uh, lighting shows. And also a lot of the groups realized that they could actually uh, become more popular because of their stage acts. They didn't just stand there and play their music. If they put on a show, they would become much more popular. And so I'm thinking about things, people like uh, Cream, which were a big live act. I'm thinking about Jimi Hendrix, who was a uh, major uh, guitarist that came on the scene. And I'm also thinking about, uh, they also started to produce these great festivals in uh, the late 60s. And one of them was in Monterey, Monterey Pop Festival in 67. And another one in uh, Woodstock that maybe some of your listeners know about in 69 in upstate New York. And both of these were major events and they introduced the world to new groups. You know, people like uh, The Who, people like uh, Janis Joplin, uh, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, all of these sort of major acts. And so therefore, I think what was happening was that... Uh, there was a growth in this sort of like live music, how it could be perceived. And that was the music that people wanted to hear. They wanted this live rock music because big crowds would show up and there would be this communal experience. The Beatles, in the meantime, were tucked away in their studios. So I think that played a part. They, 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 they weren't at the centre anymore of uh, the, the new happening in uh, rock music. And also, I think what was happening is the Rolling Stones were now producing records that were as good or were certainly uh, better in terms of their albums than they were previously. So, in other words, the Beatles now had a lot more rivals than they had earlier. And I mentioned the Stones, but also a new group that came along in 1969 called Led Zeppelin was also extremely popular and was rivaling the, uh, the Beatles at the top of the uh, the charts. So I think in the rock world, the Beatles had rivals and they had other groups that took advantage of this uh, growth in uh, live music. But I think there's another reason why they weren't as popular, and that is because they became very much associated with the counterculture and hippies. The, uh, the Beatles pretty much made it obvious that they took drugs, a lot of it hallucinatory uh, drugs. Uh, they also started to become interested in uh, things that uh, at the time were very, very strange, such as transcendental meditation. Now, I know today it's kind of a lot of people meditate, but in the 1960s, it was just seen as kind of cranky. And the Beatles were around advocating that. And they also uh, started to uh, advocate uh, influence in Indian philosophy and Indian religions. 
and uh, yoga. And uh, also, uh, it was clear that they were relatively promiscuous. Uh, again, we probably know more now than we did then, but John Lennon left his wife. He uh, moved in with another woman called Yoko Ono, and they were very public. And so people sort of realized that they were a, a, a pretty promiscuous kind of uh, group there. They all uh, married uh, women after they were already pregnant and, you know, things like this. And also, um, I think people just kind of got a bit fed up with some of their uh, political pronouncements that uh, were taking place. You know, it's still unpopular to talk about uh, opposition to the uh, Vietnam War. And also, uh, it was uh, unpopular to do things like what John uh, Lennon and Yoko Ono did, which was to uh, go to Montreal in Canada, lay in bed for a week and talk about peace. Again, if you don't know about this, this is worth looking up, the so-called beddings that John and Yoko took place, where they literally got into bed, stayed there for a week in a hotel, invited the media in, and then talked about peace. And again, this wasn't what something mainstream America or even mainstream Britain was that highly uh, in tune with. So I think that they kind of, uh, they lost a lot of their uh, popular base also because their views were no longer in tune with uh, what was happening uh, elsewhere. For recording music. Well, thank you for sharing that knowledge with us. And now listeners, if you want more, we must, must, must encourage you to go and get this book. It's Joy and Fear, The Beatles, Chicago, and the 1960s. John, can you give us some more information? Where, who, who's it published by and where can uh, our listeners buy that from? Yeah, it's uh, published by uh, Permuted Press, Press, which is a uh, New York publisher. Uh, you can buy it in all the sort of major online, you know, you don't need me to tell you which ones they are, Barnes and Noble and Amazon, etc. Uh, I always say try and get it in your local record. So it isn't on sale in... Uh, uh, America and also in the UK. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't really been able to do many public appearances where I can sign the book because of the pandemic. But I'm, I'm uh, this year coming up now. I've got a full list of uh, speaking engagements, and uh, where you can find out about them is if you uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, Instagram, or um, also on Facebook, and uh, you'll easily find me. John F. Lines, usually Beatles is attached in some way <laughs> to my uh, name. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Patrick, for inviting me on the show. I'm a big That's fan a of your pleasure. podcast. And uh, hopefully your podcast will become as big and as influential. <laughs> as <laughs> well, hopefully it won't end in quite the same way. But yeah, that's the dream. Thank you so much, John, for coming to join us on the podcast to talk about your book all about the Beatles. We're so, so grateful for having you. Please do pop by again very soon to discuss any further books or scholarship that you undertake. So, John, on behalf of myself, the co editors of Versus History, much appreciated. We look forward to hearing from you again soon. All the best. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Versus History podcast. Visit us at www.versushistory.com and follow us at Versus History on Twitter and Instagram. You can download all episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify or from wherever you get your podcasts.